So the title of my presentation is Rapidly Exploring Random Topics. So I'll go over some different kinds of works that I've done over the years, give you a little bit of uh, industry stories mixed with uh, academics. All right, so for the first part of the lecture, let's talk about motion planning and the background that I've had in that. So back in the early 1990s, I got fascinated with the robot motion planning problem because it could very nicely be characterized as a kind of search in an abstract configuration space. And the goal is simply to get from point A to point B, which involves moving a robot from an initial to a goal configuration. So it's very nice. It's just a simple kind of searching problem to find a path, right? But the space is often very high dimensional, maybe four, five, six, 10, 20, even a thousand. And so that makes things somewhat complicated. It's hard to visualize. And then you have these obstacles here that correspond to um, configurations that are in collision. So these are not directly given to the algorithm that has to search and find a path that connects A to B. So back in the early 90s, one of the most popular methods that was gaining a lot of momentum was the probabilistic roadmap approach, which was developed by researchers at Utrecht University and Stanford University. The idea of the probabilistic roadmap is to generate many samples in the space at random. Some will lie in obstacles, some will lie in the free space, the collision-free part. And then the roadmap is constructed by trying to connect pairs of samples that are close to each other. And eventually, after doing this many, many times for, say, a few thousand samples, you end up with a kind of dense graph called a roadmap. And then to connect A to B, you just get onto the roadmap by finding um, a nearby vertex that's in the roadmap from your point A. You do the same for point B, and then you use a standard graph search technique. So in my own background, I was an electrical engineering student, and um, I had a lot of uh, coursework and, and, and research background in um, control and dynamical systems. And so one of the things that looked very difficult for me was just simply connecting these points together. It may look like a straight line in the configuration space, but with my electrical engineering background, um, in my understanding of differential equations, I thought of this as a two-point boundary value problem for many of the cases that we encounter in robotics. For example, if you have non-holonomic systems, or if you have a, a system with um, dynamics that's higher order, so there's momentum and drift, then making some simple connection like this is, is not so easy. It ends up being a kind of steering problem. So because of that, I was thinking about it going back to around 1993, 1994, I had this image of some kind of space-filling tree that there must be. I had this image that there must be some kind of way that a tree could just be kind of pulled out very nicely and done in such a way that um, each part of the tree corresponds to applying some input to a control system. So that was the intuition that I had. And then it took many more years of thinking to come up with something that seemed to work. I had this idea that one should try to grow a search tree that attempts to connect the initial configuration to the goal configuration. So when you build a search tree, what are the different steps? Well, you have some starting configuration, and then you have to figure out some direction you might want to go, and then maybe you put another uh, vertex there. So you have a root vertex, and then another vertex, and then you imagine this iterative process where you pick one of the two vertices, and then you just extend it in some direction, and then go from there, and continuing onward step by step. So if I just grow some tree like this, there's some kind of process where I have to, one, select a vertex in each iteration, and then two, extend it in some direction, and then add another vertex to my tree. So we started here, and perhaps I would like this tree to grow and fill the space, and maybe try to be biased to reach some desired goal. Um, let's say this is point B, and this is point A that I'm starting with. So I wanted to use some kind of random sampling methods to try to grow trees like this. And I did a lot of experimentation across the, the, the mid-90s, coming up to around 1998. And um, one of the ideas I had that seemed very reasonable, that turned out to be a bad idea, was just pick a vertex at random in the tree and then go in some random direction in the space and then add a new vertex. So if you do this over and over again, it seems like such a tree intuitively ought to just kind of uniformly cover the space, but it turns out it's a horribly bad idea. The tree, in some sense, folds in on itself, and the vertices just get more and more tightly concentrated around the initial 
configuration. So that was kind of a surprise to me, but after thinking about it, after doing the experiment, writing some code and trying it out, it became obvious why that was happening. So after many years of thinking about it, it hit me one day that you should not be thinking about which vertex to select as if it's just a set of vertices and there's some distribution over the vertices that you sample from, but rather you're really sampling from the space itself. So the idea is you pick some point at random in the space, say it ends up being over here, and then you find the nearest vertex in the tree, or nearest part of the tree, however it might be represented, say in this case it's this one, and then um, you try to extend the tree in the direction of this randomly chosen point. And maybe you try to drive all the way there, or maybe you don't. I imagine it is one of these whack-a-mole kind of games, like as if um, these samples just keep appearing, you find the nearest point in the tree, you try to go there as if you're going to hit the mole, and then it disappears, and then another random point occurs in the space, so maybe it's over here now, and then you find the nearest point on the tree, and you try to go towards it, and then it disappears, and it keeps going like this. So I imagine that the space itself that you're trying to explore is filled with all of these kind of advisors that are, that are trying to taunt the tree. They're saying, hey, drive towards me, and then in each step, you, you pull the tree in this way. When we did this, um, it, it ends up providing a very natural bias towards exploring the space. And so the distribution of nodes that you select ends up being very naturally adapted to the space itself, rather than some kind of distribution like uniform or Gaussian or whatever it might look like for these vertices. So the space itself is the thing that's tugging. So that was the key insight that led to the rapidly exploring random trees. The idea um, for the name came from rapidly mixing random walks from randomized algorithms. I had been working with Rajiv Motwani at the time at Stanford in the 90s, and I liked the, the sort of ring of that. This ends up being a very efficient method and is still widely used today. In fact, um, James Coffin and I won the Milestone Award from ICRA last year for the most impactful paper roughly 20 years after its publication date. Throughout the years, I became interested in a number of different motion planning problems. There's the sampling-based motion planning algorithm called the Rapidly Exploring Random Tree, which I just explained a little bit of the motivation of what I was thinking at the time. I also did a significant amount of work on feedback motion planning, going back to my PhD thesis work, which involves value iteration, optimal control kinds of concepts where we could compute um, stochastic, optimal, non-holonomic feedback plans for robot motion planning for systems up to maybe two or three degrees of freedom, but it had all of these extra complications to it. Um, eventually, I got interested in writing a book that tries to unify um, control theory with computer science and algorithms and AI forms of planning, trying to pull all these things together in one place so that both discrete and continuous forms of planning appear in one, uh, one place. And so for that, I wrote this book, Planning Algorithms. Most of that was done in 2004 and I immediately made this available for free online. After writing this, I felt increasingly guilty about the information requirements for robot motion planning. It seemed that there was always a perfect cartoon-like world, and I started to wonder more and more about what's realistic for assumptions about where the information is coming from for our planning problems. That led me down a path towards minimalism. For example, if I have a mobile robot in a two-dimensional environment like this, if its job is to just systematically cover the floors, does it need to have a complete geometric map of its environment? Does it need to know at all times precisely where it's at? So this, of course, corresponds to the SLAM problem in robotics, but I would like to know, um, for a given task, what's the minimum information requirements? And then this results in a kind of information space, which is an idea that comes from not information theory, but comes from game theory. And the idea from game theory, which goes back to von Neumann and Morgenstern in the 1940s, is that some games have complete information and some have imperfect information. A game like Battleship, for example, has imperfect information. You don't know where the pieces are of your opponent on the board. Uh, Kriegspiel is like that. It's a variant of chess. Chess has complete information, but Kriegspiel does not. In that version of chess, you do not know where the players are. And this corresponds very naturally to what a robot faces all the time. It cannot sense and measure everything. It might be tempting to place sensors everywhere on the robot and take in as much data as possible and then have a kind of big data problem, let's say, where you've measured everything imaginable. Um, but on the other hand, if you know that your task does not require all of this, I believe it's much better to um, put minimal sensors on the, on the system this leads to lower power consumption, lower amounts of computation, and the robot might be very robust and effective anyway. 
So it's important when dealing with this kind of uncertainty about the world around the robot to understand what can you just leave uncertain, right? What, what, what is it that it's okay to not measure? And what do you absolutely need to measure critically? And if you understand the separation, to me, that's the most important aspect of handling uncertainty. It's not necessarily dealing with the noise and smoothing and filtering and other kinds of things that will have to be dealt with somewhere. But the most fundamental challenge of dealing with uncertainty in robotics is to in fact know for the system you're building and the tasks that you have in mind is to know what precisely needs to be sensed, what kind of information needs to be maintained. And that's what these information spaces are good for. So for several years, my research group at the University of Illinois worked on minimal sensing, filtering, and sensor fusion methods. So I'll give you a simple example of that, something that we called combinatorial filtering methods. So suppose you have a couple of bodies moving around in an environment. Could be humans, could be robots. Here's one of them in red, and here's another one in green. So they're moving around in some kind of way. And we'll say that that's unpredictable and cannot be directly measured. However, when they move, they have to move along a continuous path, so they cannot simply teleport from one place to another, but we don't know very much more about them besides that. For sensing, okay, one possibility is to just put a camera maybe on the ceiling, or maybe a number of cameras, so that you can see exactly where they're moving and estimate everything about them. During these current times when people are concerned about privacy, that could be an issue, um, but I want, to, um, I want to formulate a much simpler sort of version here where we just put in these kind of beam detectors. They just have three kind of straight beams here. And I will call them A, B, and C. And all they do is simple detection. So they're just binary detectors. And so when these bodies go moving around, I just observe a letter A, B, or C based on which beam it is. So when that happens, we imagine over time the information that you get from the sensors looks like this. A, B, B, A, C, A, B, 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 C, A. It looks something like this. We just get a string of observations from the sensors. And then I want to ask the question, what do we know about where these uh, two bodies have gone? So that's the idea of a combinatorial filtering kind of problem. It can give you an exact answer to some questions, but it does not have to determine uh, precisely the location. There does not have to make very complicated, perhaps probabilistic predictive models of where they might go to answer certain kinds of questions. So for example, one very interesting question is, are the green and red bodies in the same room? And by room, I mean this part, this part, or this part. So the rooms are delineated or bounded by these um, sensor beams that we have here. So there's three different rooms, and I'd like to know which one of the rooms um, not sorry, I'd like to know whether or not they're together in the same room. I may not be able to know which room they're in fact in, but I would just like to know that based on this kind of information alone. So here's how this kind of thing works. So we show that there's a very simple combinatorial filter that solves this problem. And it works like this. Um, initially, suppose I tell you that they're in the same room. So they're together in some room. They're in the same room. I don't know which one. So it could be the red and green are together here, or here, or here. That's the logic. This is state S in some kind of very simple combinatorial filter. And then if I observe A, I'll put it up here and I'll say they're in different rooms and A is the boundary between them. Because if we observe A, that means one of them jumped over the boundary. I'm gonna make some assumptions that are general position, um, that, that, that amount to general position, which means that they do not both simultaneously move over a beam or they do not come up to a beam and then turn around and come back, so they actually cross it. So if that's the case, then when A is crossed, we know that they're in different rooms, but A is the boundary between them. And we don't know which one is on which side, that's okay, we leave that uncertain. So we have this. And the same thing happens if, we have, if we're in this DA state of the filter, or sensor fusion method, then um, if we observe A, then we know they're together again. And by symmetry, the same thing happens for DB and C, based on whether we observe um, B or C. And if they're in different rooms and A is bound, the boundary between them, if we observe C, then we know they're in different rooms with B as the boundary between them. So then we put over here a C. And that goes in both directions, and I can complete this diagram by symmetry. 
So we end up with this very simple filter. I call it a two-bit filter because there's only four states to it. So it's only keeping two bits of information. So two flip-flops is enough to keep track of the information if all you care about is whether or not they're in the same room together. Maybe they have some kind of um, explosive personalities and you just don't want them in the same room together. So this would keep track of whether or not they're in the same room together um, with, a, with a very, very simple method. It respects privacy. It's a very simple kind of sensing mechanism. And you can look for a journal article on this by um, my research group, by Benjamin Tovar, Fred Cohen, and myself, called Sensor Beams, Obstacles, and Possible Paths. So as we developed more and more minimalist sensing and filtering algorithms, we started to wonder about what kind of feedback motion strategies could be made for robots that use these, um, these filters. And so in that particular context, we could not assume that the entire state is available, but rather we get just enough information to be helpful for solving some tasks. This led me into a fascinating area of dynamical billiards. And in this field, um, imagine one of the simplest versions here. We have a polygonal environment, so it's a two-dimensional environment in the plane. And then we have this kind of point billiard ball, which you can imagine as a robot. And suppose it's moving in some direction like this. And then when it hits the wall, we assume that it bounces in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So it's a perfect kind of mirror bounce. And it continues on its way. Right? And then when it hits here, it bounces again and so forth and so on. And we assume that it goes on forever. And then I wanna ask a question such as, um, what does that trajectory look like? Is it periodic or does it um, hit every open set inside of this space? And so it turns out that for almost all polygons and almost all initial conditions, this trajectory is ergodic, which means that the frequency of visits to any particular part of the configuration space here, considering position and orientation, is proportional, or the, the, the frequency of visits is proportional to the measure or volume of that region, regardless of its shape or location, which is really powerful. This is an asymptotic kind of result, but I find that really fascinating. So it suggests that if you allow some kind of bouncing, okay, in motion planning, we usually do not allow collision, but let's say it could even be a virtual bounce. Maybe you get very close to the wall and then the robot rotates and moves away. So it could be a virtual bounce or an actual physical bounce, but what we want to understand then is what happens in the limit as it continues to bounce and bounce and bounce and fill the space. So with these very simple laws for bouncing, we get, in some sense, excellent coverage of the space. The next thing I wonder about is what if we change the particular bouncing rule? So you can have bouncing rules that take into account small amounts of information and then decide to bounce differently. And there's different properties of those that will emerge. It turns out that these problems were originally studied, these dynamical billiard ones, were studied mainly in the Soviet Union at first by uh, Sinai, who was a student of Kolmogorov, and they were interested in this kind of borderline case of Hamiltonian systems, because whenever you have these reflection laws, there's volume-preserving flows. But if you look at it from a roboticist perspective, it doesn't have to be Hamiltonian at this level. We can make any kind of bouncing laws we want. We can say that the robot always has to return orthogonally away from the wall, or maybe the bounce angle in here, this interior part, it's always 90 degrees. So you can do a number of things, or you can say maybe with an odd number of bounces it does one thing, or an even number of bounces it does another. Now the information you keep track of is just how many bounces you've had, and only in fact whether that's odd or even. So there's a number of things you could, you could do here. You could also combine this with the combinatorial filters that I talked about before. Maybe when a beam is crossed, you change the behavior of the bouncer. So this just gives you some kind of flavor of the kinds of things that are possible with this minimalism, minimal amounts of sensing and sensor fusion, and then minimal feedback going into the system that I think can still lead to some very powerful and useful behaviors, especially if we consider reduced complexity kinds of robots, which might be appropriate if there's a very, very large number of robots or they're on a very small scale or both. We next tried to find objects that behave like billiards or at least bounce around wildly. So we started with a well-known toy called the weasel ball. It has an off-center weight inside that causes it to move around erratically. We notice that once you pull the weasel off, it actually explores its environment quite well. It's not a perfect billiard, but in practice, it seems to escape any region we place it into. We then created various kinds of gates that enable one-way controlled transitions so that the balls could be guided into desired regions.
The gating principles are very general, and we looked into other modalities such as swimming robots and controlling vibrating bugs. The bugs transition from region to region by falling off of short ledges. We were also able to reproduce this experiment with live crickets. Finally, we built some simple differential drive robots that use combinatorial filters as information feedback to decide on region transitions. This final clip shows simple robots that are guided into patrolling in a clockwise direction, while the previously mentioned 2-bit filter keeps them from being in the same room together at the same time. In 2012, I went to Oulu, Finland on a sabbatical with my family. The purpose of the trip there was to write a book about minimal sensing and filtering based on the research I had done over the past decade before that. Um, I was very interested in writing this book and giving it away for free on the internet. But then after we got settled in, a couple of months later, I got one of the biggest distractions of my life, which was um, developing a virtual reality headset. I was contacted by one of the founders, Jack McCauley of Oculus VR. The company had just had a very successful Kickstarter campaign and they needed to make the headset work in a hurry. And Jack was Googling for terms like quaternions and Euler angles and he came across my planning algorithms book. And that's really all that happened. He just sent me an email and I looked at it and I was just about to send them off to somebody else. But I thought about it. I also talked with my wife, Anna Yershova, and she was interested in helping out as well. So we thought, well, maybe we can make this headset work. In this apartment here, we had a secret lab where we were working on the Oculus Rift head tracking. And um, the, the problem was to take a sensor board like this one. This is actually one of the, the original Oculus Rift sensor boards. And on it is an inertial measurement unit that has a three-axis gyroscope, a three-axis accelerometer, um, and also a magnetometer, three-axis. And so the, the problem is to take this sensor as it moves around it's actually inside of a device like this, so you put it on your head and as the whole thing moves around, you have to figure out what is the orientation of the human head. So it's basically just doing some kind of tracking or localization to a roboticist in quaternion space. So to me as a roboticist working in motion planning and then working on sensing and filtering, it seemed very natural. And I would also say that I was just barely able to pull off the work on the Oculus Rift because of my C++ experience. I had a lot of experience on that simply because of the motion strategy library. I put a lot of effort into that free library when I was at Iowa State University in the 1990s. And then um, from that, I developed enough skills to be able to be you know, reasonably competent software engineer in the, in, in the group at Oculus. And I was able to contribute then to the head tracking. So it was very interesting working with sensors such as this while I was at Oculus because I learned a lot about different sources of uncertainty. One of them, for example, is that um, for the MEMS elements inside of a sensor like this, take the linear accelerometer for example, it actually has a very strong dependency on temperature. And being in Finland at the time, it was very easy for me to plot out that dependency by taking the sensor, putting it out of the window in the middle of January in the cold Finnish winter, and then pulling it back in and then checking the values. It has an internal temperature sensor as well, so then I could check the values that it was saying for acceleration. It should be 9.8, but it started varying quite a bit. And so I was able to use that data and help compensate for that to get more accurate measurements of linear acceleration. In developing the head tracking for the Oculus Rift, I first worked on essentially the localization problem, determining which way the head is oriented so that you can show the proper images and the latency, the amount of delay from the time you move your head until the time the images appear needs to be reduced as much as possible. So one of the things I did was develop predictive tracking methods that are actually based on human perception so that it has as little artifacts as possible. You'd like to get the geometric information on the screen to get into the right place at the right time with as little, uh, let's say, distortions or errors as possible. So the problem of doing head tracking for the Oculus Rift is very similar to mobile robot localization. So what you do is you integrate the data from the gyroscope, so that's providing angular information, you integrate it over time, and of course you end up with drift error, as we all know in robotics. So then you have to correct for the drift. So what do we do for that? Well, we use two sensing sources for that. One of them is to look at linear accelerometer data. And in that case, that should give you some kind of idea of which direction is down because the, the whole um, the estimation of, 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 the, of the orientation of the headset would start to drift and tilt over time. But the trouble is that it's very hard to make a sensor that measures the down direction because a linear accelerometer is going to measure the vector sum of the gravity vector 
and the true linear acceleration of the headset. And so this ends up being a challenge trying to separate these two out. There's really not enough information there, but we were able to develop some heuristics to do that. The next problem we had to deal with as part correcting the drift error was the yaw, which corresponds to which direction you're facing. The rotation axis for that is parallel to that of gravity, so you cannot use the linear accelerometer for that. In that case, we used a magnetometer, and then it ended up being a very challenging problem to calibrate the magnetometer and use its data in a way that's, uh, say, accurate enough down to at least a couple of degrees or so, so that when you're in a virtual reality experience and say there's a cockpit in front of you in some certain types of games, the cockpit just doesn't start drifting away while you're playing. So that was the next part. So once we got those two components working to correct for the drift, the linear acceleration part and the uh, magnetometer part, we could then have very accurate um, estimates of the headset orientation in quaternion space. The next challenge after that was to do six degree of freedom tracking, which we accomplished with a camera and special markers on the headset. And this also worked quite well and eventually made its way into the Oculus Rift consumer products. One of the things I found fascinating by developing a consumer product was that minimalism was important there as well. Nobody wants to spend extra money on, on components that are not necessary, so there's no reason to put extra sensors that you don't need. If you have a device like this and you're wearing it on your face, you certainly do not want extra components because of the weight. And furthermore, ultimately, there's a, a, a tendency to want to eliminate the wires on these devices. And as you go wireless, you end up with significant battery issues. So you also don't want components that are unnecessary and consuming power. So I found that fascinating because when I was looking at pure mathematical theories of, of sensing and filtering, my, my emphasis was on minimalism. And then um, when I was looking at the development of consumer products, minimalism became important again. It seems like sometimes in the middle, um, people are obsessed with very complicated kinds of solutions in engineering research. But at both of the extremes, from um, say pure theory over to actual consumer products, I think minimalism ends up being the most valuable thing. Don't add anything that you don't need once you understand what the tasks are that you're designing the system for. One of the things I learned very quickly was that my robotics background was very well suited for consumer product development in virtual reality. It just happens to be that uh, we're always dealing with sensors that have to measure information from the physical world. We have computational challenges. We also have actuation in robotics, which there was not in the VR case, but at least these first two components of sensing and computation were very natural to me, uh, dealing with the challenges of the physical world. Most of the people I was working with came from the video game industry, where they worked in perfect geometric abstractions. Everything works very nicely in a, in a pure computer graphics world. And so I think it was often surprising to them that um, the information that we got from sensors would not work perfectly. Like for example, why can't you just double integrate the data from a linear accelerometer and expect to get the position accurately? And as, as everyone in robotics knows, if you try to do that, you'll very quickly end up with a horrible drift. Not usually because of just integrating Gaussian noise or some kind of simple thing like that, but very often there's a systematic uh, calibration error that's very hard to compensate for. And as I mentioned before, there's um, also a dependency on temperature, even on stress on the particular circuit board, all kinds of things can come into play. So very often there's systematic error that contributes to the uncertainty. And if you double integrate that error, you end up with quadratic um, drift, which grows very fast, leads to very high error rates. So even though on paper in an idealized world, double integrating a linear accelerometer seems like a good idea, in practice it's a very bad idea. And it was very challenging for me to to convince the uh, the bosses at Oculus that this was a, a bad idea or this really should not work, even though it seems to work on paper or works in a perfect simulation. I started off at Oculus VR as a consultant working on the head tracking, but eventually my role grew into one of chief scientist as I worked on a number of things, including leading a team of perceptual psychologists, working on health and safety issues, and helping to develop a best practices guide for the entire community. I was really quite shocked to see that the company was sold when it was less than two years old for $3 billion, and there was a lot of publicity surrounding that. It also kicked off a huge interest across all of industry in developing virtual reality. Also, when I went back to the University of Illinois, I was approached by professors from many different research fields who wanted to use virtual reality in, in, in their fields, and that was very nice. So I got to learn many more things than I, than I would have before. In 2018, I returned to Finland, but this time for good. I became a professor at the University of Oulu and started the Perception Engineering Lab. Perception engineering involves creating and maintaining perceptual illusions. 
These are much like optical illusions, but more general. It could involve hearing or touch, other senses, or could even be a higher level form of perception, such as the illusion of presence, making you feel like you're present somewhere else. An example of that, which my group is very interested in, is telepresence, which involves a mixture of robotics and virtual reality. To pursue this subject effectively, we have a highly interdisciplinary team, which involves neuroscientists, perceptual psychologists, mathematicians, as well as engineers in the areas of robotics, control theory, and virtual reality. So I was asked to offer some perspective on my career, coming both from academia and also spending time in industry. I'm sitting in a sauna now because sauna is the one word that Finnish gifted the English language. Saunas are very important to Finnish people, and it's a good place to talk about life and other kinds of personal things. So let me talk a bit about the pros and cons of academia versus industry. So for academia, what I really appreciate the most is the ability to do something for the public good. It feels great to me to be a teacher, to conduct research that the public can share. I love the idea of writing books, giving them away for free, writing free software, um, tutorials, anything I can do for the public. I feel like in the universities we're, we're supported by public funding, so we should be giving something back to the public and the world at large. And to me, this feels really good. It's very rewarding. I also prefer the university environment because it caters well to my curiosity. I really want to explore new things. I like learning. I like trying to deeply understand things and then explain them to others. So the university is a nice environment for doing that. We're not constrained by any particular markets, but can really try to dig down deeply and try to figure out the answers to difficult questions, or in most cases, figure out what the questions are supposed to be, the right ones to ask. One of the reasons why I enjoy working in Finland at the University of Oulu is that I believe education should be free. So this is a publicly funded university that does not have tuition for the residents of Finland. When the tuition is free, I feel like I'm serving the public, and this also makes me feel good. There are many advantages of going to industry as well. One of the biggest being, of course, you can earn a much larger salary. You may also find yourself having a lot of funding for research if you're in an industry research lab. Um, there are, however, many challenges as well. I think at a fundamental level, it's a kind of dictatorship. So if you're the CEO or one of the core founders, then you get to say what gets done and you get to lead and command everyone. Um, if, and if you're in that position, most of your time may be spent on non-technical aspects. It's very hard to run a company. It's a very life consuming kind of process, even if it's a small startup. If you prefer to do technical things like I do, then you probably will not be in that position. Um, but then the challenge becomes trying to do the work you want to do and convincing the bosses, let's say, or the owners, that this is the right thing to do. It's especially challenging because you cannot expect everyone else to have the same research background that we have. So you may understand a problem very deeply, and you may even be able to explain it very well in a couple of minutes, but it still might not work, and people will um, have, have a difficult time trying to get their point across. So I've certainly struggled with that um, throughout my time in industry, and I think others do as well, especially if they have a strong uh, scientific or academic background. One of the reasons for that is that our training and research causes us to identify what we don't know. It's, it's very important to know what you don't know. In the process of getting a PhD and the process of doing research, it can be very humiliating because um, we start off early on feeling very smart, like we know many things, and then as we get further and further into research at the university, we realize we don't know much of anything. It's very challenging. And this does not necessarily go well in industry if you, if you talk in this way that, well, it's complicated, I'm not really sure, the answer could be this, could be that. Um, people running a company usually want black and white answers, yes, no, very quickly, and they want to act on it. So very often what happens is someone who might be relatively naive about a subject might appear to be more of an expert. This is often known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, where um, a, a novice will sound very confident because they're not aware of their own incompetence. And then an expert may sound rather unconfident to someone. They start to forget that the things they've learned are actually not easy for everyone else. Other people have not struggled with those same challenges before. And so they may come across seeming overly modest or even unsure about what they're doing. So this is a strange outcome. Remember that, that, an, that an expert can seem less confident than a novice, especially in an industry setting. Another challenge in industry is that you have to hide information. So there may be information hiding between multiple groups inside of a company that are competing for resources, or of course, there are always companies competing with each other and hiding what they know. And that really is the opposite of what goes on in academia where we try to share what we know. In fact, we're often just excited if anyone's paying attention to what we're excited about and what we have figured out. So I find that really challenging. When I discover something, 
have some new idea, have some deeper understanding of something that I've been struggling with for a long time, I want to share it with people. And in industry, it's very, very difficult to, to do that. Um, you certainly can't share it with another company. You may share it with um, another research team, perhaps, or another group that's working on a product, and then it may go completely to their advantage. They may be able to get more resources than you because everyone's hiding and protecting their information to a large extent. And that's, um, that's very hard for me. I, I really like to, um, to just give away whatever it is I've learned. So I spent about the first two decades of my career in academia, and then I spent most of the last decade working mostly on industry things, including my time at Oculus as an early founder and the chief scientist up until it was bought by Facebook. I was also a vice president and chief scientist of AR, VR, and MR for Huawei Technologies. And um, during that time, I also was an angel investor and spent a lot of time advising venture capitalists. I was meeting billionaires, flying on private jets, talking to Hollywood experts, um, had all kinds of doors that were open after the Oculus time. Um, it was very exciting. I learned many things, talked to many different kinds of people I would never have met before as a pure academic. But ultimately, I decided that I'm much happier in academia. Um, I think it's very difficult to, um, um, to, to weigh these two carefully. And I think that in academia, it's very easy to get lost in the shuffle of um, trying to compete for more papers, for more citations and more funding. And I think university administrators have pressured researchers more and more over the last decade or two to try to operate things like a company, right? They, they, they might view the, the, the money that the professors are bringing into the university as the ultimate goal or the amount of citations or publications as the ultimate goal. But really the goal is for the people in the university to deeply understand these problems they're working on or to find the right problems to work on. It involves a lot of creativity and it takes time to do the right thing. And so if you're in a university environment and you're able to have creative freedom and you're able to explore your curiosity, then it's a far better environment. But if you feel like you're in a university environment and it's pressuring you to just be in a kind of rat race that's just pushing for more publications and more citations and more funding, then if that's all you get out of it, you might as well go to industry because then at least you can optimize just getting money. So if you're going to work hard for something that's a kind of bean counting oriented goal, it's maybe better to count money beans than uh, paper beans and citation beans and, and, and money that's only in the form of funding. So, um, I, I, so I find that it's, 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 to me, much more enriching to be at the university, but it has to be, in some sense, on my terms. I have to be able to do the work that I want to do. And if I can't do that, well, then maybe I'll go start a company or do something else. But, but I think that um, I'm really the happiest when I get to um, explore the problems that I want to explore and work with interesting people. I love working with very bright students, very bright postdocs. I like working with younger people in, in, in the group who can teach me all kinds of things based on their own expertise and I continue to learn and grow. This is also very important in the university environment, especially where everyone's conditioned to share in their knowledge. So I, so I love this. I love how we're all able to mentor each other, young people and older people as well in one environment. So after spending a lot of time in both academia and industry, I decided this current phase of my life, I'm really happiest in academia. I like doing my work for the public good. I like writing books and giving them away for free. I like giving away free software, tutorials, anything I can do to try to help the public. I was very excited to see that the IROS registration this year is free for anyone in the world who's interested in the topic. So that, that's a wonderful step. It makes me very excited. Well, that's all I have. Thanks for watching, and I hope that you can come and visit us someday in Northern Finland.